Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Monday, January 4th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, Does Anybody Care? I mean, my goodness, with a title like this, we could go down any avenue we want. But today, I just want to talk about some market performance because we had a rare down day across the board on Wall Street today. I want to talk about the Georgia Senate runoff a little bit that's going to take place tomorrow. I believe there's already been a few million votes already cast. Some news this is, of course, another phone call uh, that the president was recorded on with some Georgian election officials. I have not listened to this tape in its entirety, which I typically like to do before I talk about it, but I've, I heard some clips of it, which seem pretty damning to me. So I just want to talk about those a little bit today. I was curious about corporate profits, so we're going to talk about corporate profits, looked up some of that data. Some of you are most likely aware that uh, over the weekend, there was some vandalism at Nancy Pelosi's residence in San Francisco and at Mitch McConnell's residence, I believe, in Louisville, Kentucky. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Basically, cancel rent, give me my money, Mitch, all this type of stuff. And then, of course, we have the circus coming to town, the March on Washington, D.C., this Wednesday, January 6th, as Congress convenes to certify the presidential election. And then a couple other things, if we have time to talk about it, because like I've stated, 2021, economically speaking, is likely going to be worse than 2020. <clears throat> so don't forget, as we described and discussed last year, uh, the global famine that is likely to take place this year, according to the United Nations, according to the IMF, according to the World Bank. And don't forget, last year, we destroyed, I couldn't tell you how many tons, how many millions of pounds of food in this country. And I'm sure that took place globally, too, in some of the more developed and industrialized countries. So understand this. There is a global famine projected for this year. I imagine that's going to come to fruition, unfortunately. I hope their projections are wrong. I hope I'm wrong in my belief that they're correct. But understand that. Global famine, we destroy millions of pounds of food. Figure that one out. And then talk about, you know, inflation, if you will, starting to show up. Shipping rates, especially when it comes to your vessels, are going through the roof. Rates are doubling, tripling in some instances. Those costs are likely going to be passed through. I mean, there's only a few things you can do, folks, when you start to see these types of costs, these prices going up. Somewhere along the supply chain, those companies along the way, yeah, they can eat some of it. So that's going to be a hit to their margins. Now, most companies are not going to want to do that. They need to make a certain margin to keep the lights on. But they also want to maintain their market share. They also want to keep their customers happy. And passing along higher prices is not generally going to make their customers very happy. So they can eat it or they can pass it along, those price hikes, to their customers or maybe a little bit of combination thereof. Any one of those scenarios is not good. Any one of those scenarios is proving what I have been stating here since I have started this podcast in 2019. That inflation is here, and it is going to get worse. And if we continue to do what we're doing with the Nobody Cares Act, Nobody Cares Act 2.0, the $1.3, $1.4 trillion spending bill, that monstrosity, just to keep the lights on in this country for a few more months, is going to destroy the dollar, going to destroy your purchasing power, because we don't have it. We have to print the money to make up for it. This is a first world banana republic. This is a default by other means called inflation. And if the debt clock is right, the U.S. debt clock is right, fast forward to the year 2024, just another presidential cycle away, folks. 
49, almost 49 and a half trillion as it stands today, as it stands right now. Look it up, usdebtclock.org. Almost at 49 and a half trillion in the year 2024. They're just assuming current rates apply. Well, you know, there's really four idiots running for Senate in Georgia, and it really almost doesn't make any difference which ones win. But if it should be the Democrats that pull off a victory, especially in both seats, and get a majority in the Senate, that means the Democrats are going to control the White House, the House, and the Senate. Look out below. Now, if the Republicans are able to pull out the win, maybe they'll slow some stuff down that gets passed by the House and is sort of uh, advocated for or supported by the White House. But that's all it's going to be. It, it, it's just going to be a, a wrestling sideshow. It's all a distraction. That's what I preach here. I don't know how many times I have to say it. I don't know how much more evidence you need to see before you understand this, that these people do not care about you, that this is all a circus. It's all a sideshow to keep you distracted as they run away with trillions and trillions of dollars of our money, stealing it from the future, stealing that future prosperity just to keep every, well, some people happy presently. We sacrifice the long-term health and prosperity of this country just so everybody can feel good for the short term. And that is not a prudent and proper way to manage a society. It just isn't. We are running out of runway. The cliff's edge is right in front of us, and we are going to go over it full speed. And not just us. This is happening globally. But there is no leadership. There is no, there is no action being taken right now. Nobody wants to be proactive in any of this. Don't touch the hot stove. You're going to get burned. Everybody seemingly has to touch the hot stove to learn the lesson. That's where we are. People have seen this coming a mile away. The unsustainability of this. It's, it's math. It's math. Just as the U.S. debt clock says in four years time we're going to be at 49 and a half trillion all of this other stuff is the same case if those assumptions hold if this math holds that's it that's how we can put satellites in space that's how we can send something out way out there and bring it back because of mathematics that's how it works this isn't voodoo economics this isn't voodoo science this is basic math yet people don't understand Mathematics. They don't understand basic economics, and this is why we have the problems that we have. And everybody wants to believe that everything's free, and that money grows on trees, and that politicians are good and honest folk. They're not. They just want to make promises that they cannot keep, and they don't care. Why should they? They get elected. They get a very nice salary. They get excellent benefits. They get a pension. Why should they care what they say to you? They just want your vote. So they can get a nice salary, a nice pension, and excellent benefits. They don't care about you, and it's evident in their actions every single day. And, you know, you could make the argument before they used to do a lot of this stuff, you know, in those back rooms, smoke-filled, everybody smoking a cigar, plotting against the people, just going to steal everything. They did it out the back door. They did it in secret. Now, they're doing it in sunlight. They're doing it on the front porch, the front door, right in front of our faces, and nobody wants to pay attention. Nobody seems to care. Our government, at the end of the day, is just a reflection of us. It's just a reflection of who we are. That's to some point why we have Donald Trump as the president of the United States. He's not the disease. He's a symptom of the disease. He's a reflection of a lot of this country. And he's still going at it, which we'll talk about here shortly.
So market performance, a rare down day, if you will, across the board on Wall Street. The uh, U.S. dollar is currently in the red, but relatively close to where it was trading during yesterday's podcast. Dollar index is at 89 spot 74. But there was a lot of uh, weakness across the other major currency pairs in the day session. So there was weakness with the British pound, the Aussie, the New Zealand dollar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, there's been a reversal on that in overnight trading, and there is just a lot of movement, a lot of volatility in the currency market. So as far as I'm concerned, something is afoot. There's a lot of rebalancing that started at the end of last year, beginning of this year, people putting on some big trades, what have you. But uh, I think volatility is going to be the name of the game here. Uh, some big movements right now in the Australian dollar against the U.S. dollar gaining one half of 1%, same as the case for the New Zealand dollar against the U.S. dollar. Those are big moves with respect to the currency markets. Let's see, we also have a big move with respect to the uh, Canadian dollar appreciating against the U.S. dollar by a quarter of 1%. Very volatile session today with respect to Bitcoin, but it's currently trading at 30,810 points. I'm, like I said, I don't focus on Bitcoin a lot here. If you want somebody who is a huge supporter, at least for the time being, of Bitcoin, pay attention to Real Vision and Rao Paul, and there's a whole bunch of others out there on the internet and on the financial mainstream media. But if you want somebody who is a big critic, a big critic of uh, Bitcoin, listen to Peter Schiff. <laughs> it's really all I have to say for you. I mean, he goes off on Bitcoin almost on uh, a daily basis or whenever he has, uh, he puts out a podcast. Uh, and he makes some very good points, excellent points. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's your decision at the end of the day. If you understand that this is most likely a bubble, you can still make a lot of money uh, speculating in something that is going to go up or something that is going up. But just understand that it's most likely a bubble, as I think Tesla is, and we're going to talk about Tesla here in a moment. Overnight futures trading, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is flat. The S&P 500 is up one-tenth of one percent. The NASDAQ 100 is up two-tenths of one percent. Cash trade in Japan is down one-half of one percent. A sea of green across the pond in Europe with the UK markets putting on the biggest gain, 1.7 percent. And the Australian markets are currently flat. Now, with respect to uh, some U.S. shares here, especially with the tech sector that we like to uh, mention with our market performance, we have Apple losing 2.5% for the day, Microsoft and Amazon both down 2.1%, and Facebook gave back 1.5%. However, I guess all is right in the world because Tesla was able to put on another 3.4% and is now trading at $730 a share. Now, they sold fewer than 500,000 vehicles last year. Of course, Elon Musk, the CEO and founder of Tesla, had a goal of hitting 500,000. They fell just shy of 500,000 vehicle sales for last year, uh, but people don't care. Uh, this is the poster child of the everything bubble, and Tesla is probably going to become, uh, when it's all said and done, probably uh, setting itself up for one of the biggest shorts maybe in history. Uh, and that might very well be the case uh, with respect to Bitcoin as well. But this is just ridiculous. L look at a chart of Tesla. There's no way this is sustainable. Uh, their market cap is basically the size of the entire auto industry or very close to it. Makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, yet it's just this name that people seem to recognize. It's a story stock. Uh, I guess it's a good bedtime story that everybody wants to believe in. Uh, I'm not a believer in it. More power to them, but, you know, there's this thing called competition. And I just don't think Tesla's going to come out uh, the winner, especially not by this big of a lead that markets would have you believe. But we'll see who proves right at the end of the day. On the commodity front, we did have oil trading up during last evening's podcast, but there was reversal during the day's trading session. WTI is trading at $47.38 a barrel. Brent is at $50.75. And natural gas is trading at $2.64. However, with respect to gold and silver, as I stated last night, you know, a lot of times we'll see on the overnight trading session on Sunday evening, you might see precious metals in the green, but come the day session, it's in the red. That was not the case today. Gold and silver held their own. 
Gold is trading at $1,937 an ounce. Silver is at $27.24 an ounce. We are in the very early innings of a long-term bull market with respect to precious metals, and I also believe commodities, as I have stated many times before and as I stated yesterday. Everything is set up for precious metals and commodities. Now, of course, with respect to commodity prices, a bull market means higher prices. Doesn't necessarily mean that those prices with those commodity prices are justified. But when you're printing money like it's going out of style because it is, that money's got to make its way somewhere. And if I'm right that this is basically going to be a decade of survival because this is the greatest depression, well, then you need things to live off of, to sustain yourself. That's commodities. It's not all of the fancy tech gadgets and gizmos. It's the real tangible stuff. Something that actually means something. And can you imagine if we should see oil prices spike? And the reason why oil prices came down today is because, well, the headline, at least the headline for today, right, the headline economy, is that, well, now they're starting to project, because of further restrictions and lockdowns, that oil demand for 2021 is going to be weaker than was previously indicated and expected. Can these people make up their minds? I mean, one day oil's off to the races because everything's coming back, and then the next time it's these headlines. It's all noise, folks. It's the printing press that's driving all of this stuff. Now, this is a central banker's world. We're just, you know, we're just fortunate enough to be living in it. It's their world right now. But can you imagine higher prices across the board? Commodity prices, oil, natural gas, your agricultural products. I just talked about a global famine. This is a one-two punch. We don't have the stuff. We don't have the food. And now the prices of it are going up. Well, because, of course, there's the food isn't there. There's no supply, but there's still the demand for it. Prices are going up. Printing press is on. That cash has to find its way somewhere. That's where it's going. And then, of course, because we and many others are acting like a first-world banana republic or a third-world banana republic, wherever you might be, this is the loss of confidence in those fiat currencies, and rightly so. The destabilization of various governments. And we are likely to see the collapse of governments continuing this year, or the attempted overthrows of various governments. Throughout this decade, I'm not just placing all of this on 2021. This is this decade. So, of course, people are going to hedge their bets. Of course, people want to go back to something that has proven the test of time and that has served as money for thousands of years, and that's gold and silver. And especially with respect to silver, if you have a continuation in the tech sector that continues to grow, if you have the desire for a quote-unquote green economy, well, you need silver as a base metal in a lot of those technologies especially solar panels. So there is nothing really but good news and great news for gold and silver. So look into it. Own them outright. Have them as part of your portfolio as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I, like I said, I'm not here to really give the advice. I'm here to tell you what I do and what I think you should look into. Physical gold and silver the mining stocks, not just for gold and silver, but for all those other commodities and agricultural stocks as well. And then to round it out for market performance, Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note is yielding 0.92%. Don't forget all of these markets are pretty much broken, uh, except in my opinion, the, the commodities market for the time being, and, but especially the precious metals market. That one's manipulated. That's, that's, those are your choices. They're either manipulated or they're broken, and you might be able to call one and one the same. But that's, those are pretty much your choices. But I am holding out hope that uh, market forces are still more powerful than central governments and central banks. But it just takes a while because when you can print trillions of dollars and just throw them into the system, that's, that's going to buy you some time. 
And it's really anybody's guess on the timing of all of this. That's what makes markets. That's the, that's the tough thing about it. But we need these markets. We need the stock market. We need the bond market. We need the global economy to correct. It's going to be painful. There's no easy solution. There's no get out of jail free card with this. But that's what's needed. It's called a correction for a reason. Corrections are good things. But the problem is we have so much debt, we have so many distortions, we have so many malinvestments across the spectrum that it's going to be extremely painful. But don't forget that corrections are good things. Like the analogy I like to use, if you're writing a paper, you put a lot of research into it, hopefully, you put a lot of thought into getting your ideas on paper, sharp, concise, to the point, making a lucid argument, an analysis, a presentation, whatever it might be, and you put, take it to your professor, your teacher, before the due date, and then they get the paper back and there's a whole bunch of red ink on it. Now, nobody wants to see a whole bunch of red ink. You put a lot of work into it. Spent a lot of time into it. You thought it was really good. But the teacher isn't marking your paper up in all of that red ink to upset you. It's not because they don't like you. It's not to frustrate you. It's to help make that paper better because if you had turned that paper in as it was, you're getting a D. But now with the corrections, you're going to get a B. You're going to get an A. And isn't that what we're supposed to be striving for in our society, in our economy? Aren't we supposed to have the best? Isn't that what we want? Should be. But in this economy, we have zombies walking around. 20% of U.S. corporations are classified as zombies, and that number will go higher before it goes lower. In this year, in the following, we're likely to see a tsunami wave of bankruptcies and insolvencies. A lot of these companies should be out of business. That's part of the correction. But they are being kept alive, and they shouldn't be because it hurts the broader economy. It hurts long-term growth and prosperity through innovation and productivity, which is not happening now because you're keeping waste afloat. And it hurts those entrepreneurs and established businesses who are engaged in implementing best practices and are running a tight ship. Because what should happen in a well-functioning market is those poor businesses, those poorly managed businesses would go out of business and the well-managed businesses would pick up the market share. That's how it's supposed to work. But that process, that correction, is not taking place. And it's at the expense of future growth and prosperity. So we ain't seen nothing yet. Because if printing money was a panacea, then we would never have a problem. We would never have a recession. We would never have a depression. We would never have a market sell-off if it was that easy. But that's not how this stuff works, works, folks, so don't be fooled. All right, that's some of the market stuff. Corporate profits real quick, because I do want to talk about the political shenanigans. So real quickly here with corporate profits, and I'm sure we'll have a further discussion on this, but this is corporate profits before tax, okay? Corporate profits before tax peaked back in the third quarter of 2014. All right, so that's before Donald Trump. He can tell, you know, uh, toot his horn as loud as he wants to that this was the greatest economy ever under his administration. Well, look, corporate profits before taxes peaked in 2014. All right. But, but in the depths of this recession, kicking off the greatest depression, wouldn't you know that in the third quarter of 2020, Corporate profits before tax hit an all-time high at $2.4 trillion. Now, if you look at this chart, it's, it's definitely a V-shaped chart. Bailouts, subsidies, trillion-dollar tax breaks. I wonder how we finally got to this point, huh? I, I mean, you're, this is just another one of these correlations that are breaking down. As I stated last year, that once this everything bubble bursts, and it has, and it's there's going to be another big pinprick this year, next year, whenever it's coming, that there was going to be 
a breakdown of traditional correlations. Well, typically when you have an economy in a recession, you have sustained profit losses. Well, this one just big sharp spike to the downside and a huge rebound. Now, with respect to corporate profits after tax, after tax, we did have an all-time high in the fourth quarter of 2019. Well, I mean, how did that happen? Trillion-dollar tax cuts, mainly going to corporations, which drove a trillion-dollar deficit at the federal level. There's no free lunch, folks. But now, same case here. All-time high with corporate profits after tax right now in the midst of a recession kickstarting the Great Depression at $2.1 trillion. So there you have it. We'll do some further analysis on this, but I did want to share that with you here briefly. Uh, Donald Trump, another phone call. I don't know if he's calling this another beautiful, perfect phone call like he did with uh, the Ukrainian president last year, which led to his impeachment trial. But here you have it. Here's another one calling up some Georgia election officials. Uh, I don't remember who off the top of my head again. I will listen to this thing in its entirety. I believe it's close to an hour long. I'm sure some of you already have. But nonetheless, basically asking these officials or this official, uh, can you just find uh, 11,000 and some odd votes, uh, basically 12,000 votes? I just need one more vote. I just need one more vote to beat Joe Biden in the state of Georgia. Can you recalculate? Can you recalculate that? And then he says in the very same sentence, after he says this, but we won the state of Georgia. Well, then why do you need another 12,000 votes? If you won the state of Georgia, Mr. President, why do you need 12,000 more votes? You already won. You know, people go after Joe Biden having a few screw looses upstairs because he does. But he's not the only one. You see, these were the two idiots, the two delusional idiots that we had the privilege and honor of voting for. This is the best we can do in the United States of America. Of course, I voted for Joe Jorgensen, the libertarian candidate. I'm, I'm done with these two parties. Leave them. They have left you. They don't care about you. I don't know how anybody in their right mind can support either one of them. I really don't with what they're doing. And again, this isn't even the smoke-filled rooms anymore. This is right in your face. I can understand before they did a lot of this stuff, cloak and dagger behind closed doors. Now it's in your face. Now there's no excuse. So he's on the phone call asking for a recalculation, even though Georgia has, uh, you know, confirmed the vote by with three times now. They've had three recounts down there. Joe Biden won them all. Recalculate. That's an interesting word. Do you think, do you think this is the first time in Donald Trump's existence, even just, you know, the 40 years of his professional uh, existence and experience in business. You think this is the first time he ever used the word recalculate? Wouldn't it, nice, wouldn't it be nice to be a fly on the wall on some phone calls with some of his accountants? Can't you just recalculate that? I, I mean, it, I guess it's a surprise, right? It's a surprise that the man has gone bankrupt several times in his uh, career, including casinos. Yeah. Can you, you could just recalculate that, can't you? So somebody who has been crying foul and fraud uh, since, well, before Election Day, is now on the phone with an election official asking them to recalculate just so he wins by one vote. It's not as if he was making the case, hey, you have to make sure, as, as he puts it, all of the legal votes are counted and, and all of the illegal votes are thrown away. I want to know what the true number is. Nope. The president isn't concerned with what that quote-unquote true number is. He just wants to win by one. However you got to do it, just recalculate. This is not a per perfect phone call. And I can guarantee you, to my Republican friends out there, had this been Joe Biden on a phone call, you would have lost it. Rush Limbaugh, Dan Bongino, Mark Levin, Glenn Beck, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, they'd be dead because they would have stroked out if this was Joe Biden on a phone call demanding asking very emphatically, hey, recalculate so I win by one vote, even though I already won the state. See, th th this is 
again, more proof right in front of you that this system is out of control. Does anybody care? Not really. And then I happen to be watching CNN, which I have not watched in a long time. I haven't watched much of any news in a long time, and it's very refreshing. You should try it. But they were down there in Georgia asking voters, uh, Trump supporters, Republicans, what do you think about the, the election? And, and, and just a handful of these people, the election is not over. They're very curious to know what takes place on Wednesday. They do not trust the system. They do not. There was one person uh, who was asked, uh, well, what about the votes? I mean, uh, said, I don't trust the votes I, and I will never trust another vote. Do you know how harmful this is to this system, to our constitutional republic? This is a very slippery slope. And if we go down, we may not be able to come back from it. This is extremely, extremely dangerous. And I imagine the reporter, when he heard that from this uh, Georgian voter, was shocked by that statement that I, I'll never trust another vote. Now, maybe due to the shock, he didn't have a follow up. But my follow up to this gentleman would have been, well, what happens if your guy wins? Would you trust it then? That's what we have here, folks. It's, it's all about winning. We are supposed to be on Team America. America's screwed. We're supposed to be on Team Constitution. The Constitution shredded. You're red or blue. You're Team Democrat or Team Republican. And all you want to do is win. All you want to do is win at any cost. And the cost is the Constitution is shredded and the country's going down the tubes. That's the cost. That, that is a, and I can guarantee you that what that gentleman stated, that he doesn't trust the vote and will never trust another vote, again, he is not the only one that thinks that. And he's not the only one that's probably saying it either. If we cannot trust this process of voting, we're in a lot of trouble. So I ask you, does anybody care? Because you better get off of being on Team Red or Team Blue because neither one of them cares about you. You already have the Nobody Cares Act 1.0, 2.0 just got passed. Don't worry, 3.0 and 4.0 are coming down the pike. How much more do you need to see before you lead them, leave the, these parties and make a stand? We'll find out, but there you have it. Does anybody care? Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.